Uh, so we are today in chapter 19, and we're going to do something a little funky uh, with, with this chapter today. So um, uh, there's, there's some part of this chapter that some scholars think kind of got spliced and added to the end of the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. Um, so we're going to take all of Exodus 19 uh, all the way through uh, verse 25 of 19. But then we're also going to add to that, we're going to skip most of chapter 20, and we're going to add verses 18 through 21 of chapter 20 to all of that. Next week, we're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments themselves. Um, and next week is going to be the, the end of our quote-unquote first season of, of Exodus Zoom Bible study, um, because uh, uh, Joel and Kate are going to be going on vacation at their lovely Texas Austin ranch house here on Millstone Drive and not gonna leave for anything for two weeks. Um, so we're excited for that. Um, but uh, rather than um, uh, trusting you all with, with a substitute, and I'm sure we've got plenty of people who can do great work, I'm selfishly wanting to, to continue leading, uh, on <laughs> leading you all and, and hearing all of your uh, good thoughts. So after we hit the Ten Commandments, there's gonna be some homework for the next couple of weeks I'll be giving. Um, uh, so look forward to that. Uh, it'll be good fun. Uh, but after we hit the Ten Commandments, we will come back and um, there's more information about that that I'll share uh, at the end of the study uh, regarding day, time, and so on and so forth. Sound good? Okay, so uh, that means that um, although we're going to hit chapter 20 tonight, we will not be dealing with the Ten Commandments or, or as they're sometimes called the Ten Words. Um, we're going to be looking at kind of all the all the text around that today. Um, and uh, after after we read, I want to walk through some of the chapter 19 can be a little confusing. If you're trying to follow it in your head, it can be sort of like a you know Moses went up and down and up and down and then down again and then back. It's just very confusing trying to to trace what's going on in chapter 19. So we're going to talk a little bit about that before we get into asking questions. Um, uh, so if you're confused when we go through that, don't worry, most, most folks are, there's a reason for it. So all that being said, we're going to read chapter 19 all the way through and then jump to a chunk of chapter 20. Um, I need one, two, three, four readers. Um, the first reader I'm going to have read, uh, verses one through six of chapter 19. Who'd like to be the first reader? Uh, Diane, I saw your hand first. You've got it. Um, and then the next reader is going to read verses 7 through 15 of chapter 19. Verses 7 through 15. Uh, Kurt, I saw your hand there. Uh, the next reader is going to go 16 through 25 of chapter 19. Uh, Gloria, I saw, well, I, got, I saw both Gloria's hands, actually, I think. Um, Gloria Dees was the first hand I saw. And then Gloria Munguia, if you'd be so kind as to read chapter 20, verse 18 through 21. Can you do that? Excellent. All right. Um, we'll kick it off with Diane. You'll need to unmute and then let us know what translation you're reading from. Okay. I have the, I think it's the NIV. <laughs> uh, trying to find for sure. Yeah, NIV. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you on the whole earth, wait, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me 
a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Thank you, Diane. And mm -hmm. nice work with the the <laughs> words. <Yeah. laughs> um, How do you really these, say that word? <laughs> I think it's Rephidim. Um, okay. Some of these Hebrew names are are just uh, they're not not easy for us Westerners. Uh, all right, let's go to Kurt, um, and you've got seven through fifteen. Let us know what translation you're using after you unmute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, using the NRSV. Um, so Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. When Moses had told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day, because on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set limits for the people all around, saying, be careful not to go up on the mountain or to touch the edge of it. Any who touch the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch them, but they shall be stoned or shot with arrows. Whether animal or human being, they shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they may go up on the mountain. So Moses went down the mountain to the people. He consecrated the people and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, prepare for the third day. Do not, do not go near a woman. Um, and, and we can talk about that command too. Um, there's, yeah, yeah, thanks, Kurt. Uh, <laughs> uh, verses 16 through 25, um, and that was Gloria D., I believe, who had that. And go ahead and unmute. Let us know what translation you're reading from. Okay, I have the uh, NRSV. Uh, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord has de had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned, summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look. Otherwise, many of them will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate them themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people are not permitted to come up to Mount, to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and keep it holy. The Lord said to him, go down and come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let either the priests or the people break through to come up to the Lord, otherwise he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, 
Thank you, Gloria. Well read. Um, uh, and Gloria Munguia, let's uh, do chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. Uh, go ahead and unmute and let us know what translation you're reading from. I'm reading from the HarperCollins Study Bible. And, and I'm interested, I had put a little dot by this, so I don't know why, but I'm going to read it. Chapter 8, um, verse 18. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. For God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Is that as far as you asked me to read? That is perfect, Gloria. Well okay. done. Uh, did you remember why you put a dot by it? Uh, probably because of the whole situation, the thunder and lightning and the people trembling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's uh, a pretty, sorry, what was that? I'm so, I interrupted you. No, I'll have to think some more. Um, I did uh, this Bible study with Fred Morgan many, many, many years ago. So I'll have to do more mm. thinking. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an awe-inspiring sight and an awe-inspiring um, uh, experience to have the voice of God come to you. Um, and, and this, this was, um, I, I'm, I'm going to give a short presentation before we, we uh, get more into the passage, but this, you can tell based on the, 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 the number of different sort of ways of talking about this, that this was a very important uh, experience for the people of Israel. Um, it, it, it should be, right? It's where they get the law. And, and Moses, the lawgiver, uh, is incredibly important to, to the, the Jewish people. Let me share my screen um, so that I can uh, work with this, uh, some of the stuff we get about the mountain of God here. Um, so I mentioned beforehand that uh, we, we see Moses kind of go up and down and up and down and up and down. And, and I want to I kind of count the number of times God has Moses used the divine stairmaster here, um, because I think that it, it says something uh, 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 about how we've, we've gotten some narratives knitted together. Um, we, so did any of you catch where the first time that Moses goes up and down the mountain was? Uh, you can unmute and, and, and jump in. Brittany, I see you holding up uh, two fingers. Is that verse two or is that two times that he goes up and down the mountain? Verse two, I believe, is the first time he goes up. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Verse two, beginning of verse three, Moses went up to God. Very good. Um, Dave, I saw you holding up a number of fingers as well a second ago. Um, uh, okay, never mind. Um, Sarah, you, you're saying verse seven. Um, is that where, that's, that's where it came down. down Oh man, it's like y'all have my notes here. Very good. Um, good. It, it, it's nice to be careful readers. Thank you for doing that. So we've got up and down. And those of you who, who, who may not have seen where he comes down in verse seven, well, he has to go and talk to the elders. The elders aren't up there with him because God explicitly said, you know, only you, right? Uh, uh, it, it, God says that several times. Um, uh, so then Moses comes down and talks to the elders. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about that moment as well in a little bit. Um, okay, when was the next time Moses goes up? Uh, and, and Sarah, you're holding up uh, eight. Verse eight. Verse eight. Mm -hmm. Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Moses goes back up to God, uh, speaking to him uh, the, the, the words of the people. Um, maybe, uh, maybe Moses uh, needed an excuse to get away from the people because they were complaining again. I don't know. I think God probably heard them down there. Um, but, but Moses brings those up. And then uh, where does he go? Does he come back down? And if so, where? 14. 14, Sarah says, yeah, Moses went down from the mountain to the people. Um, and then he, he, he goes up again 
um, uh, you, you, you can see um, in, in, in verse 20, he goes up again, uh, after the Lord has descended upon Mount Sinai, it says, God summons Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses goes back up. Um, and then Moses comes back down to the people and tells them the words of God, or tells them uh, the commands of God, and then God's voice trumpets out from the mountain, uh, and the people hear it. So there's a lot of up and down and back and forth that's going on here. And um, this has frustrated uh, our, our, our friends who write the commentaries. It's really ground their gears because they don't see it as necessary. Um, and, and this, I mean, far be it from me to, to excuse me, uh, far be it for me to, 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 to question what we have here in scripture. I think sometimes comment, commentators are, are so good at what they do, and sometimes they're too clever for their own good. Um, so uh, uh, I, I, I would want to take them with a grain of salt. But I think that what we see here, we see um, some, uh, the, the text kind of retreading the same ground a few different times, where God says at one point, I'm going to break out against you if you come up the mountain sort of like sticking your, your, your hand too close to a fire. You don't want to do it. It's not going to be good for you. Um, and, then, and then God says it again. And Moses even tells God, you know, you already told us that. Uh, this is um, in, in verse 23. Uh, uh, he's, you yourself warned us, um, so you're saying it again. And it, 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 this, this whole narrative kind of has the feel uh, as if it was the, the, the recollection of, of several people that was brought together, woven together. Now, y'all re may remember when we talked uh, many, many months ago about these, these folks, J and E and P and D. Um, I'm not going to bring the big picture back up again. Uh, really, all, all I expect y'all to remember is that there are multiple strands. There's multiple oral traditions that the Torah is made up of. Um, and and uh, so people have hypotheses about which strand comes from which region and such. That's interesting for the purposes of what we're talking about here. We just need to know that there are some different oral traditions that get passed down. Um, and based on um, the, the, the number of interweavings that happen in this passage here, we can pretty safely assume that this passage happens in every single one of these oral traditions, or some version of this passage happens in every single one of the oral traditions. And I think that that is so cool because I think that this points to how important this occasion was to God's people. The fact that everybody and their dog was telling this story to their kids and, and was telling this story to their neighbors uh, means that, you know, each person may have emphasized a slightly different thing. You know, maybe Moses um, uh, went up and then came down and said, hey, y'all can't touch the mountain. Maybe that's what one person remembered. Maybe another person remembered, well, you know, we heard the voice of God and it was stunning. Um, and, and, and Moses, you know, then went up the mountain. Um, maybe another person remembered this beautiful idea of how God has brought us out on eagle's wings and how we're going to be a, a, a holy nation and a royal priesthood. Um, whatever, wh however these things get interwoven back together, I think the point that we can take from this is how Dear God's people held this story of the giving of the law. Instead of it being an onerous story, instead of it being a story that like, oh man, now we have all these laws we have to follow. For God's people, this was such good news because instead of looking at a God that they had no idea how to, how to love and how to please, this God is spelling it out for them, clear as day. And that was something that was like, oh, now, not only do we know the Lord, but we know what God expects of us. And so um, I, if, if you were trying to track with this passage and trying to imagine it in your head, um, know that it can be really hard to imagine this passage in your head just because um, it's been uh, the, the, the fancy word that people use. It's been redacted a number of times is what scholars think. Uh, it's, they've, they've taken you know, the strand of this tradition and the strand of that tradition and woven them together is what we think. But that means the story appeared in every single one of these traditions, which is why it's so complicated. Um, so I want to I want to name that first. Um, and uh, Brittany named something that was really cool here in the chat. She says there were three round trips for Moses. She said that Israel should be ready on the third day, and that there were three mentions 
by God, by Moses, and by the Israelites about not touching the mountain or talking directly to God. At the beginning of the passage, perhaps you notice it was the third month or the third new moon. Um, thank you for, for pointing that out, Brittany. There's, there's all, you know, we don't know the Trinity at this point of, of Israel's history, but there's almost something Trinitarian going on there. That's, that's really well noticed. Uh, so this story is incredibly important. Um, and, and I want us, uh, there, there's a couple points of the story that I want us to sit with. Um, and the first point that I want us to sit with is, is this, this beautiful um, word from God uh, for, from verses three through six. Did that strike anybody when we were reading verses three through six, when, when Moses goes up to, to uh, God, the first time he goes up, uh, the, the divine stair master here, and, and, and God says um, that he's born you on eagle's wings and has brought you to himself. Um, you'll be my treasured possession. And although all the earth is mine, you will be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Was there anything about that passage that 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 popped for you, or that you want to uh, sit with, or share with the with the rest of the group here? Hmm. Yeah, Diane. Well, I feel like it's it's very comforting and and very positive, especially after he had just warned them. Remember what I had done to Egypt. <laughs> And, and, but then, you know, if they are remembering that, then he's reassuring them that he is for them. But he also stresses in there, you have to obey me. Right, right. For this yeah. to happen. So it's, it's not really an unconditional love. It's their conditions to the love. Right, right. And we're going to, we're going to, there's, there's this idea of a conditional versus an unconditional covenant. And we're going to get into that. Um, I, I have a, the, the video I've got for tonight is all about that. Um, thank you for noticing that, Diane. Yeah, John uh, and I did, Gloria. I thought I may have been reading a little bit too much into it or a little reading it a different way until Diane, right, and, and she was on the same track that I was on. It's, you know, it sounds like a very upbeat, and very promising kind of message, but it starts out with, remember what I did to the Egyptians, mm -hmm. you know, and if you obey me, then you'll have everything, but remember what I did to the Egyptians. So that's yeah. sort of how I read it, is like Diane. Good. Yes. Thank you, John. Gloria D, go ahead. Me? Uh, yeah, yeah. You would you yeah. uh, you'd had your hand yeah, raised, so right. I wanted to. Uh, well, what what struck me is that he will hold them to be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation so these are the chosen mm -hmm. my god yeah what about yeah. the rest of us <laughs> yeah what about the rest of the world right like mm -hmm. these these are the special people is, yeah the whole earth is god's but mm -hmm. these are the i don't know maybe that was yeah. trying to convince them that they needed mm -hmm. to <laughs> follow his well, I see a few people who may want to chime in on that. Um, I saw Sarah Evans first, then Sarah Hamsa, then Dave, then Lori. My comment was, is there's, uh, you know, later on in the New Testament, we're called to be a holy priesthood, to be priests to one another. So this is the, this is the foreshadowing, shall we say, of what we are all called to be as Christians. Yes. Yes. Good. Exactly. I saw Dave give you the thumbs up. You may have, you may have uh, uh, jumped on, on his thunder there, which is just fine. Um, uh, Sarah, you next. And then Dave, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to you unless uh, yours was taken. I just wanted to say, I love that phrase. It bore you up on Eagle's wings. That's such a comforting, I mean, that, of course, that song is wonderful, but that's where this comes from, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but that's a comfort. That's a comfort for me. And those of you who've been on a walk to Emmaus may have recognized that we are the Diakonia Eagle's Wings, uh, or, or I, I think we've merged with, with you know, some, but, but we were the, the, the Diakonia Eagle's Wings cluster uh, from this passage. Um, so thank you for noting that, Sarah. Dave, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to you. 
and you'll need to unmute here. I oh, still can't hear you, brother. We'll need it. We'll need you to unmute. This, uh, to me, is one of the most important passages here, and uh, a commentary makes it very clear. If I may take a moment and just read a few sentences, it says, "As the priesthood in Israel was to be the nation as a whole, so Israel should be to other nations." As Israelite priests had unique requirements, duties, and privilege among the Israelites. So Israel would have unique requirements, duties, and privileges among the nations. Now, whole, now all who believe in Christ are the royal priesthood and a holy nation. And that comes from what you were saying, Sarah, from 1 Peter uh, 2.9, which reads, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah, that's a, that whole passage in First Peter 2 is just, an, it, it, it takes this covenant and applies it to Christians in a really beautiful way. And it also talks about how, how we are living stones built up by God, which takes the covenant that God actually makes with David and applies it to Christians. It's, it's just, it's a remarkable poetic feat um, uh, that's, that's there. Uh, I, love, I love that part of First Peter. Thank you for referencing that, and thank you for sharing uh, the, the part of the commentary that you had there. Um, Lori, uh, you had something that you wanted to share as well. Yes, I think that what makes this so uh, such an outstanding thing is that at that time, most of the people were, you know, worshiping bulls and everything else. And he's calling this group to worship him and to be so very different. And can they take the challenge? Because they're chosen to become real leaders in the moral development of the human race. Yeah, so yeah, just that struck me. That's right. Just as uh, Dave, you were saying earlier, these uh, as it, as the priests were to Israel, so Israel was directed to be to the nations. That's what it means to be a holy nation. Um, and so uh, when when Moses comes down and shares these words with with uh, the the elders of the people in verses seven and eight, um, they're like. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we're all in. Um, it, it, it is sort of the idea that I get. They're like, "Yep, yep, sign us up." Um, and I think that you know, perhaps some of them understood the responsibilities they were taking on. I think I and, and I think many of them may have, but I think that uh, uh, many of them also thought, you know, sounds like a pretty good deal. I like being a holy nation. Nation of priests, that sounds like I could be important. Maybe, maybe that sounds like I could be a CEO of a company um, uh, without having to answer to a board of directors. Oh, except, right? If you follow my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession. There's that, that gnarly if there. Um, and then when the people get addressed directly by God, I wonder if you if you if you notice that with the the passage that Gloria Munguia read in in chapter twenty, when they hear the voice of God, suddenly they said, you know, we're not quite sure about this thing we signed up for. Moses, you speak to us. We'll listen to you, but don't don't have God speak to us. That's too much for us. Um, and so I, I I think that there's. There's a, a cautionary note for us here too. Um, we can eagerly want to, you know, have have this communion with God, and I think that's good that we want to have this communion with God. But you got to be careful what you wish for, um, because when you get that, there are responsibilities that go along with it. And as we're going to see in our scripture passage this Sunday, it's going to change you. It's going to change you deeply and profoundly. Uh, and that's what these people experience here. Dave, I saw I saw you looking like you might want to say something, or you, you may have just been sitting comfortably. Uh, did you want to add something to that, Dave? 
I do, but it, it kind of reckons back to what we, a little further back when we are talking about what was going on in the mountain. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, uh, an older commentary that was written in uh, 1871, the verbiage there is just so beautiful as he explains what was going on. Uh, I'd like to read it if you have the time. If not, I know time's fleeing, fleeing so. I would love to hear it, Dave. All right. <clears throat> the descent of God was signalized by every object and every object imagination can conceive connected with the ideas of grandeur and of awe. But all was in keeping with the character of the law about to be proclaimed. As the mountain burned with fire, God was established as a consuming fire to the transgressors of his law, the thunder and lightning more awful amid the deep stillness of the region and reverberating with terrific pearls among the mountains would rouse the universal attention. A thick cloud was an apt emblem of a dark and shadowy dispensation. This gave the trumpet gave the scene the character of a miraculous transaction in which other elements than those of nature were at work and some other material trumpet was blown by other means than human breath. That's it. I love how that I painted the that. picture. That, that's just such a beautiful word image and it, it takes people of that air in the, the grammar they use that we don't hear today to express that. And I just loved. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Dave. I appreciate that. It, um, when, when you're hearing, not hearing, when you're just reading the words on the page, it can be really hard to get that, that sort of seismic, you know, everything coming together and, and declaring who God is in a, in a really profound way. Uh, I, I love the way that commentary means that. Um, yeah, Kate, go ahead. Um, I think another connection that I'm making is that this feels a lot like the Ark of the Covenant um, and like temple, um, temple practices, mm -hmm. right? Like only certain people can go in this location. And um, not that I think that God is trying to set up the logistics of the temple, but I think he's trying to help the people understand this is who I am. And this is what this means. Like, I am this way. I, I have these huge, unimaginable powers and, and knowledge. And that means you can't just walk up to me like a person, right? Um, and so, yeah, I just, I was making that connection as we were reading. And I think that like, I'm sure that the Israelites looked back on this experience and went, ah, yes, I remember we did that and we're still doing that today. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's that's a really important point to name, and that gets into um, the the next chunk we're going to look at for for about ten minutes or so, um, specifically verses like ten to fifteen, nine to fifteen. Some of these uh, we I think we talked a couple of weeks ago about how sometimes God seems a little persnickety um, about the 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 ways that that God is asking the Israelites to do things. And, and I love, Kate, how you connected it to the temple and to the tabernacle and some of the practices around the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I mean, those of you who've seen Indiana Jones uh, know that if you open the Ark of the Covenant, bad things are going to happen to you. Your face is going to melt off. Um, and, and while not based in you know, any sort of historical reality per se, there's some really like massive implications about God's holiness being contained in a place that means we have to treat it sometimes with kid gloves. Um, we have to be very prepared to handle holiness. Otherwise, we're going to get burned. Uh, and, and so it, perhaps it's less about God being persnickety and more about something that's, that's a real characteristic of God, that God cannot be handled um, uh, by, it can't be handled and definitely can't be handled 
sort of flippantly by human beings. That if we try and handle God, it's the same as us trying to handle a live coal. There's something that is, you know, stupid. <laughs> like that's that's not the way that the world works. And so I think that that it's 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 both an intentional parallel that's there, like you were naming, um, and and it's also based on a, a, a very important characteristic of God, and that's God's holiness. God's holiness means that God is completely other and completely foreign in some profound ways to us, that we can understand God to some degree through Jesus Christ, but ultimately the God that we serve, um, as, uh, as it's put in, in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, when they're talking about Aslan, yeah, he's good. He's not safe but he's good. Uh, and that's, that's what our God's like. That's what it's like to be in the presence of holiness is we got to We got to do that carefully. Um, so looking at verses 10 through 15, or like the, the, the last chunk of nine through, through 15, when, when Moses starts telling the people how to consecrate themselves, what to do, what not to do. Um, I want to I want to open it up to see if uh, if y'all had any thoughts on that and, and and give us an opportunity to talk about that a little bit um, about uh, you know maybe maybe there's you know there's some severity to 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 what Moses is asking the people and there's um, some some specific assignments to give to the people. What what sort of thoughts do y'all have that you want to share on that? I mean, I'll go, I'll go right to where you <laughs> said we could go if you wanted to. Yeah. What was the bit about on the third, you know, be ready on the third day, don't go near a woman? Yeah, yeah. So Moses is, is um, he's addressing a community that's, that's co-ed, but uh, he's addressing strictly the men. Um, at this point in, 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 in history, women were, were thought of as possessions. Um, and so Moses was, was telling the men, don't go near a woman, meaning uh, don't have sex, uh, basically. Uh, you're, you're, you're supposed to remain uh, sexually pure in, 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 in some respect. Um, and, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll see, we're not going to continue this study into Leviticus, but if we did, um, then, then we'd see certain elements of the law that have to do with that. Go ahead, Sarah. Just the NIV, NIV version actually just says, abstain from sexual relations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is sometimes, sometimes the, the NIV, uh, I think they call it dynamic equivalence, where they balance thought for thought in translation and also word for word. It's, that can be a little bit better than the NRSV, which uh, is, is very word for word, um, uh, which, which can be a good thing sometimes too. Um, but yeah, there's... Uh, if you'll notice, and I think this is kind of neat, and, um, and then, then we'll go to Dave. If you'll notice, that direction is not a direction that God gives Moses. God gives Moses some directions, and Moses understands one way of remaining consecrated as avoiding sexual relations, uh, which I think is interesting. Um, we may not get the full quote from God, uh, uh, and, and Dave, I, I saw that, that Sarah Hampson had unmuted, and I've, uh, I, I've heard from her once, and so I want to go to her, and then I'll, then I'll go to you. Uh, I'm sure you'll have some, something good to say. So go ahead, Sarah. I, I was just, my commentary states that in that verse, the sexual relations rendered a person virtually unclean for that day. And then the reference comes from 1 Samuel 12, 4. So um, that... That was, I guess, the old rule. Right. Moses was still under the old rules, I guess. Well, and, and what's, what's interesting, too, is that Moses hasn't gotten these laws yet that we know of. Um, this is the Levitical law of ritual cleanliness that it's talking about there. Um, so I, maybe, maybe he, he got a, a, a special revelation from God beforehand. Uh, thank you for noting that, Sarah. We'll go to Dave, then we'll go down to Gloria Mungia. It, it it would seem like if you you take 
this text as a whole, uh, this starting somewhere around five on down, in a way, are we not seeing more or less a formation of the Old Testament church? The church is now being formed, and this is how it is being formed. Is that not what we're seeing? I like that way of looking at it. I think that's, that's exactly it, um, is, is we're seeing the covenant that structures the nation of Israel, which is the, the, the church in the Old Testament. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and I think we're also seeing, uh, to your point, some of the, uh, we're, we're seeing the, the in a nutshell version of Leviticus. Um, maybe, maybe that's what you, were, what you were suggesting there with what you're saying too. Uh, Gloria Mungia, uh, we'll go to you and then uh, I wanna share this, this video about covenants with you in a minute. And Gl Gloria, I'll, I'll need you to unmute uh, so we can hear you there. Going back to this, do not go near a woman. My study Bible says, and through the sexual act become ritually defiled for a day. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, there's. Mm -hmm. Just for a day. <laughs> Just for a day. <laughs> and then it refers to Deuteronomy 23.10, which I haven't looked at yet. Yeah, there's. Uh... I think that um, anything that has the the sort of power that sex has over human beings um, it, it historically has it's felt like it's needed to be regulated uh, to some degree, um, and and I think that that's that's what what we see with a, a number of the the legal codes in Leviticus is these are ways of taking something that has such power and putting it in a context where you know you can trust that it's going to be safe um and, and i think that, that that's that's what we see over and over again with how god helps to direct the israelites is is god saying you know in, in, instead of trying to to you know grow blindly in the dark uh and, and figure out what's right and wrong let me spell it out let me spell out for you a way of living let me spell out for you a way of living where you don't have to worry about getting yourself in trouble if you follow these commands um, now, we can get in trouble today by assuming that every single command that was given to the Israelites, all 600 of them, are going to apply in the exact same way to us today. Um, and and, and there's, there's a lot of Bible interpretation that needs to happen in order to, to translate some of the ritual cleanliness codes to what we do today. And, and you know, what we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, but suffice it to say, this was a way of life that gave the Israelites um, a, a, almost a, a life preserver to hang on to. This was something they rejoiced at getting because now they're not guessing. They're not having to guess as to what's going to delight God. They know now. They've gotten words from God. And, and you know, with, with stuff as, as, as potent as, as sex is, along with the other stuff that, that we see in Leviticus, it's really important that the Israelites know that they're sort of working within boundaries that are safe. And I think that's, that's the great triumph of this legal code, even if there are certain parts of it that seem a little odd to us. What's, what's this ritual on cleanliness that's going on? Um, what do you mean don't go near a woman? What if you are a woman? What's going on there? Uh, there's, there's some things that, that need to be updated, uh, uh, that even though God does not change, human beings do. Um, let, me, um, let me share with you this, this video that I've pulled up uh, from our friends at the Bible Project. They were the ones who did that, that big drawing video at the, at the beginning of our time in Exodus. Um, this is a, a video they've done on covenants, and I thought it was particularly important for us uh, uh, based on some of the, the observations that Diane and John had uh, on this text, with this being a conditional covenant, um, I, I'd like to share it with you because I think that it, it gets at some of the, the stuff there. So let me share my screen. Um, and I wanna make sure I'm sharing sound. Uh, okay, we should be good. Here if you've been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, 
or your father, or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right. And this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many. And he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises, and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought the flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption. And Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah saying, listen, I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great. So what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant is that God is promising to be faithful, even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel in obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure, somehow. Yeah, they called it the new covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus, is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who is able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David, and so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who are becoming more and more faithful.
The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. Hey, this I just every time I watch a Bible project video, I get psyched about what God's doing in my life. Um, I hope that you all have the same experience. And if you don't, then I'm sorry, because I'm sure there will be more of those videos for us. Um, the, the idea of the covenant and of Jesus being the one who keeps it, finally. Jesus is the true mediator who hears the voice of God spoken to him and then speaks God's truth and God's promises to us. Uh, Moses was, um, was good at what he did, uh, but Moses was not the true mediator to be able to go between the people and God. And he's, he's ultimately going to fail at it um, and, and, and does fail at it. Uh, Jesus does not. Uh, and, and that's really good news for us. Um, any, any final thoughts about this chunk of scripture uh, before we close out for the evening? Uh, seeing none, uh, let me close us in prayer, and um, we will next week be looking at the, the Ten Commandments, uh, and um, we're going to try and give them all uh, uh, all equal time. Um, that's probably not going to happen, uh, but we're going to do our best. Uh, let me close us in prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much for giving us your word. Thank you for speaking to us, and thank you for understanding our humanity and giving us a mediator so that we can tolerate you speaking to us. Help us to have the courage to uh, keep your covenant and to look to the one, when we break your covenant, to look to the one who never does. It's in his name we pray. Amen.